Hi, I'm Maddox Olerath, and I'm Jehu Samanik. Our video videographer is Gabe Matthias, and we're going to be interviewing Mike Bachman on Thursday, May 18th, 2023, at Marquette University High School. Um, our first question for you is going to be, like, where were you born? St. Joseph's Hospital, uh, 5001 West Chambers is the address, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, what was your childhood like growing up? Growing up, I, my address was 6030 North 64th Street. Um, I was there until I was about five years old, five or six years old, before my parents divorced. Um, it was really restricted, you know, because being so young, obviously, parents, you know, kept boundaries for where I could run out and explore. Uh, my next place where we moved to was about six or seven. There's a lot more places to go. It's 9121 West Custer. It's still in the city of Milwaukee, and there's big fields out there across the street from Timmerman Airport. A lot of fun out there, a lot of bicycle riding, a lot of pickup games for baseball with these big fields, uh, pickup basketball. Uh, after that, about, oh, maybe about 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old, we moved to uh, 5410 Lover's Lane Road, once again in Milwaukee. Uh, back in those days... There's four houses, and it's right just south of Silver Spring. Uh, there was a, a Shakey's Pizza, and it used to be farms. It was my grandparents' house back then. So my grandparents built a house, and we took that house over. You said your parents were divorced. How do you think that affected you long term? Long term, difficult to say. A lot of people have asked that question. I think, uh, I think it kind of motivated me. Uh, as far as like uh, street street smarts, I guess you could say there's book smart and street smarts, you know, and I think that kind of came into play. Um, I took it as a challenge, also of what not to do, you know. Not, you know, my dad passed 27 years ago, but rest his soul. But learn from other people's mistakes and don't repeat them as best as you can. Um, did you say you had any siblings? You have a brother, uh, four years younger. Uh, he lives out in uh, Heartland, and he's a machinist, basically. What was your relationship with him growing up? We're pretty good, pretty good. You know, a typical sibling rivalry. You know, you get your fights here and there, but when it came down to it, you know, big brother's always looking out for little brother. You know, if there's a funny story you want to hear, one of the houses we moved in after... We moved out to Brookfield, and my brother came home from Bowling Alley at Bolero. Dad, Mike, this guy wanted to fight me, and my friend Jimmy, I said, where are they? I'll go get them. So I jumped on my mom's bike. I hit the corner of the street. Sand was on it, wiped out, big raspberry. I said, I ain't going to fight them guys now. I'm going back in and crying. <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of funny. But, yeah, we, we stuck up for each other all the time. and still do. Still pretty close relationship with, with my brother. Um... Uh, the first neighborhood from the first place I referenced is was, was pretty diverse. Uh, my, my best friend back then, his name was Curtis. He was, he was a black kid, and him and I just had a blast. Always, always had fun. I always looked forward to seeing him. You know, we'd play in the backyard, um, and then when we moved to the second place on Custer, there was a bigger, wider group of people. It was very diverse, you know, and everybody seemed to get along. You know, like I said, the pickup games. You know, kick the can, hide and seek, you know, all this stuff. Everybody in, in that complex that got along. And then uh, we moved out to 5410. There was an apartment complex to the south, which was diverse, but it was, like, too far for me to go. You know, so I met up with this one one kid, and him and I, he was, like, three years older than me. And we had a pretty good time, and I still, every so often, I'll run into him and, at a gas station or something. Uh, with all these moving of houses, were you going to grade school? Or like, what grade school did you go to? My grade school was very consistent all the way through eighth grade. I went to Emanuel Lutheran out in Brookfield. Uh, it's a private school. And then, uh, pardon the scratching. And then eighth grade, when we moved to Brookfield, I went to Elmbrook Middle School, which is now called Pilgrim Park. Uh, Pilgrim Park, it was 
which school? Emmanuel? Yeah. Uh, Emmanuel, it was a class, I think the most in the class was maybe 14 or 15 throughout, you know, and, and it's a sm it was a small school. Sometimes you had two classes in one classroom. Um, Pilgrim Park or Elmbrook, when I went there, it was Brookfield East and Brookfield Central to be students. They went, they all went to that school. So there was over a thousand kids for seventh and eighth grade there. And very big, I don't want to say, not maybe a culture shock because you're used to just sitting at the same desk all day and not having to do a bell, go, go by the bell type of thing. Do you have any hobbies growing up? Uh, baseball was big. I was a big baseball kid. Uh, skateboarding, which I was into it, but not as big as some. Uh, BMX. I was in a lot of BMX bicycle stuff. Um, you know, train sets. Every so often, my, I get a train set for a Christmas gift to just add on to what I had. I had a pretty decent one at one point. But, uh, you know, that was pretty much it. It occupied a lot of my time. Mentioned you had a friend in your neighborhood growing up. What, um, were you close with any of your other neighbors or just like, close with anyone? Uh, besides Curtis, you know, and, but Curtis, that was from you know, when I was able to go outside, probably about three or four years old. So that relationship was short term because of the divorce. However, it was a good relationship, you know, and, and uh, the one when I lived on Highway 100. The guy I still run into every so often, you know, it, that, that was pretty good. Even though he was a little bit older than I was, we still had things in common. A lot of, lot of bike riding. We did a lot of bicycle riding. Uh, where did you go to high school? Brookfield East High School. What was that experience like? Well, I knew a lot of the people because of that eighth grade experience. So I knew a lot of people I went to Brookfield East, a lot of people I went to Brookfield Central. Um, I'd say... Not to toot my own horn, but I was pretty popular. Known as a, you know, kind of a jokester and a prankster, you know, athlete. You know, I participated in football, wrestling, baseball. Um, backed out of football. I had a back injury, so I really couldn't fulfill much football, which eh, I guess my brain didn't get scrambled that way. Um, if you went to college, did you, or where did you go? I went to Stratton College, downtown. I uh, became a Certified medical assistant, as also a lab technician. Got hired on right out of the. I did an internship out at Elmbrook Hospital, uh, a place called Harwood Medical, which was uh, in the professional building. So that my internship from that, they hired me right on the spot, basically. Uh, did you work any jobs in college? Like, okay, for yeah, I, I pretty much just worked one job, and that was bartending. That paid for a lot of stuff. You know, I, I was able to get some some assistance, obviously, but that was a long, it was long hours. Long, it was four days in a row. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Then in, in the middle of the week, I didn't have to have to work, but I still had school. But I never missed a day of school and still graduated like a 3.8, so. Um, what was your college like? Like, what did you do to pass your free time? Pass my free time? Yeah, right. It really wasn't, uh, no, not in college, because a lot of that, by that time, you know, by that time it was work and school, work and school. There was, I didn't have much free time if I wanted to maintain a good grade point. You know, work was, was hard enough because you, know, you worked that whole weekend and on you know, Sunday, have school on Monday, work Monday night, have school on Tuesday. So I'd work until, you know, 2, 2 30 in the morning and being in school by 7.30 for my first class. Do you go to any sports games growing up, like um, the Brewers at the county stadium or the like Bucks? What? I think I've maybe only been a handful of Bucks games in my entire life. Um, Brewer games, many, especially during the county stadium era. Went to a lot of those, had a lot of fun. Um, when my mom would take, take us on the special nights, like ball night or bat night. They did have a bat night, believe it or not, way back when, where they handed out actual baseball bats, which, yeah, they don't do that no more for whatever reason. <laughs> uh, what was the police academy like when you first started? So the police academy, my first day was December 6, 2004. And 
and waited almost two years, if that, a little bit over two years to get the position. And I was all fired up, excited, and being a quasi-military, meaning there's some military stuff involved in it. You know, I was looking forward to it for some, like a job with some structure, I guess you could say. And the first day just went on, you know, I, and there wasn't any weirdness, you know, because it was something I wanted to do. So there was no awkwardness in my, in my situation. Uh, what led you to become a police officer? Pardon me? What led you to become a police officer? Well, after working in the lab, I became a pharmaceutical rep for a year, and I was also a national sales uh, rep for another company. And my father-in-law, my wife's dad, said, you should think about becoming an officer. You're good with people. You, you know how to talk. You have patience. And a good cop is a good salesman, and a good salesman can make a good cop. So it kind of motivated me in, in that direction because in my 20s I thought about it, but um, there's no way I want to do that job. You know, and here I am, 19 years later, still doing it. What was the culture like at the place? Um, pretty, I don't want to say, yeah, I'd say strict. You know, I mean, there, there are your moments where you got to be relaxed and stuff, but when I came to the classroom, you know, to focus. You know, I finished, uh, I was top five in my class, in my academy class. So it's, take it serious. Are you friends with any of your, like, academy mates now, since then? Oh, yeah. We run into each other all the time. Uh, on my unit, I'm on the motorcycle unit. There, there's a probably more people on the motorcycle unit on my shift from my class than doing anything else. So there's, you know, you have a lot of people. I think we had a class of 60. And be inter I'd be interested myself to know how many are left that are still remaining. Um, was there a part of the police academy that you will always remember? Um, my instructors, I had Sergeant John O'Keen, which was fan fantastic. Um, Sergeant Zarnick, classic guy, classy. Uh, Dion Polk, he's now... These three guys are now retired. Dion Polk was our uh, physical fitness, basically, like a PE teacher. And he also taught uh, traffic law. So, and, you know, just the physical, uh, we call it, what do they call it? Uh, can't remember, the Baker's Dozen. It's 13 different things. It's nonstop running through the academy, around the academy. You know, it really, they try to aim to get you in shape. Good question. You know, when people ask me questions like that, I have to think about it. Um, I'd have to say no at this point. There's nothing that I could say it was, oh, it was all me. It was all me. You know, it's pretty much it's always a team effort when it comes to being on that job, on this job. And, you know, people know if you're a team player or not real quick. And it's, you know, there's, there's been shootings I've been involved with. You know, and maybe some traffic acts, some fatal traffic accidents. That when I get there first, there's a certain there's certain things that I have to do. But then other people come and take take care of other things. You know, so it's not me doing the whole thing by myself. Basically, it's, it's a team effort for sure. Something that I want to ask you: um, Are you like friends with anyone, or do you know anyone that was involved with like? Bambi, ben or Jeffrey Dahmer? Uh, yes, uh, Dahmer. There's a guy that was on the motorcycle unit. He's retired now, but he was part of the Dahmer thing. And it was, he was brand new on the job when, when his running with the Dahmer incident happened. He got suspended, but he got his job back because what it turned out, he was just doing his job and they. They cleared him and he got his job back, so. Uh, do you have any favorite memoirs about being a police officer? One of them, memories, memories. Uh, a, a big memory, you know, obviously graduation day, graduating from the academy. Um, you know, my, my first arrest, you know, is obviously that'll always stick out in my mind. Um, 
probably one of the bigger ones. There was uh, Officer Chucky Irvine. He died in the line of duty. I want to say 17 or 18. I think it was 18. Sorry for not getting the date correct. Uh, he was my, he was a cousin. And when he graduated, he had me pin him, meaning put his badge on. Now, just think about that. All the people that he could have asked, his mom, his stepdad, his, his sister, he, he chose me of all these people to put his badge on. I thought, I don't, I don't think there's much higher honor than that, you know. So that was big memory. Uh, just recently, this last week, went to Washington, D.C. as a... Uh, ceremonial motorcycle. We shipped ten of us out, and we did escorts for the motor for the families. It was a cops week, so there's an organization called Cops. It's Concerns of Police Survivors. So it was, the week was basically for survivors of fallen officers for the past year. So you got kids and spouses that are there, and we escort through Washington D.C. from the from the airport to the hotel, and that was my. This was my third time doing it, and it's a very high honor to get chosen to do that. Um, okay, is there any area in Milwaukee that you don't particularly like patrolling? Patrolling? Uh, I'm not afraid to, or not afraid or worried about going to any part of the city. If I had a preference, I like where I'm. I'm on the north side. On the south side, there's a lot of Spanish-speaking people, and I don't speak a lick of Spanish. So it makes makes things a little difficult. Um, when you first started uh, working in Milwaukee, were there any certain neighborhoods that you were required to police or watch over? I was on the beat, which means walking beat up on 95th and Brown Deer, a place called the Woodlands. Before it was the Woodlands, I can't remember what it was called, but the Woodlands, it, it's the largest uh, apartment complex or condo complex in the state of Wisconsin. There's over, I think there's like 4,000 people up there. Two th it's, it's high thousands. It's, it's very high volume of people. It's just me and my partner up there. You know, our station was on six, is on 69th and Silver Spring. So it's almost five miles away. So if you didn't know how to talk to people, you could find yourself in a world of trouble really quick and no backup for at least five miles away. Um, what is your favorite part about being a police officer? Uh, well, the benefits, the money. <laughs> you know, you know that was one of the questions that they asked the first day of the academy. Why did you become an officer? Oh, I like the benefits and the money was good. And, you know, and helping people and, you know, and... To say make a difference, I don't think I don't think I'm making much of a difference. However, when I'm out there and somebody sees me from the past that I've dealt with, those, my nickname was T1000. Hey, T1000, what's up? You know, so I got that nickname because in my 30s I could still get in a foot chase and chase down a 15 year old, you know, 20 years younger than me, basically. You know, so yeah, they, you know, I get people that. That are there to help me when they when there's someone on the street they hey you all right type of thing and so yeah i think that kind of sums that one up um i asked you about your favorite memories in the police academy do you have any favorite memories about uh being a police officer now uh i reflected on that a little bit with the pinning of chucky putting his badge on uh some other things that i could think of would be making the motorcycle unit that's that was my goal. I'm not interested in being promoted. This is the thing that I wanted to do from day one. And ever since getting it, I love it. You know, I, I still go to work with a good attitude. I'm not uh, cynical yet. <laughs> you, know, you know, people will warn you in the academy, when you get to about 10 years, you start to get cynical. And you start to get that who cares attitude. Well, I still care, you know, and... and I think that reflects on me being invited to go out to Washington, D.C. for the last three years because they know that I'm squared away. You know, I like to have my fun, but I'm also knowing, know when the time to be professional is. Have you always been a part of the motorcycle unit, or did you get uh, caught? I was, a, I was a regular patrolman for seven years, and this is my 12th season on the motorcycle unit, my 11th year. So I, when I got picked up on it, it was... Uh, uh, 2012, 
when I, when I got picked up for that summer. So that was the first season. So the season was higher number than the uh, years on, on the unit. Uh, what does it take to make the motorcycle? Well, there's a well. First, there's a posting. You know, so it's like it's almost like getting a new job. So there's a posting. You know, if you're interested, write a memo. So you write your memo showing your interest. Second, you go through. They go through a background check. Make sure you're a decent officer. Third, you go through an interview. You pass the interview. Fourth step is a is tra- is a new rider course where it's cone. It's a cone course. I don't know if you've ever seen any motorcycle rodeos or anything where they set up all the cones and you got it's all five mile, you got a thousand pound motorcycle and you're trying to do all these sharp turn maneuvers. They call it a keyhole, which is probably the most difficult one. Where you come in, you go in a circle and out. You can't knock cones over or hit cones because they'll be held against you. Um, the, the training, probably the most, probably the hardest training, probably on the department, I would imagine. I forget if we talked about this, but. When did you first um, know that you wanted to join the police department? Probably after my father-in-law said that, made the comment of, you'd be a good officer because you're good with people. You know, and that kind of, you know, and kind of the way the jobs were going with me, I was kind of like in between jobs a little bit. You know, I thought, well, this would be a great place to do it. I know I'm not going to open up my closet every day and wonder what I'm going to wear. I know I'm going to wear every day because it's a uniform. So I don't have to worry about filling up my closet with a bunch of clothes. You know? um, did we talk about how you met your wife? Uh, no. How did you meet your wife? On a Sunday, November 5th, 2000. I was at this little restaurant called Morton's in Cedarburg. She was there with a group of her friends. And it was me and my uncle. We are sitting there laughing, joking, having a good old time. And she's with a group of about 10 or 11 and they just kind of drifted over. Why are we in a group of this many people and you guys are having more fun than us? Well, why don't you join us and find out? <laughs> you know? So I just kind of started from there. And, you know, so yeah, November 5th, 2001, I met her and then got married uh, October 18th, 2003. I had to pause on that one. <laughs> um, and you have been married for how long? Mikey? Yep, Michael Jr. and Ryan. You know Ryan. Um, do you have any, do you, like, want to become a police officer in Well, it's funny, because Michael Jr. is talking about it, and I said, I can't talk you out of this, huh? You know, and he said, no, it's something I really think I would like to do, because I, I don't know if he just sees the way I am, as far as when I leave for work, when I come home for work, you know, I mean, I'll come, I'll come home maybe, in, I wouldn't say grumpy mood, but just one of those roll my eyes moods. You know, like, so how was your day? Yeah, yeah, it's always something out there that you can't go smooth. But, uh, you know, Ryan, you know, he hasn't, you know, he's, he's a sixth grader, so he really hasn't said anything, but. Are you the only police officer in your extended family? Yes. Yep. Um, as an actor, so my father-in-law is a retired officer, you know, so he was on the job, I want to say, 32 or 33 years. He retired in 95. So one of my best friend, or my best friend, his dad was my baseball coach. He, he retired in 95 also. He had 35 years on the job. So he worked directly with uh, Chief Pryor back in those days. And I have an uncle who's a fireman, but those are the, we're the only two civil servants in the family. Um, do police officers have like a certain on spot? On the job or off the job? Um, well, on the job, it's a, it's within uh, your district. You know, you just know where to go. You know, whether it's to grab a bite to eat, grab a soda. You know, you, you just know where to go, where you're not going to get bombarded or, you know, some of these business owners will, hey, just take, walk up with a soda. I don't worry about it, you know. So you kind of know about that. So it kind of kind of can backfire because of too many find out about it. Then it gets abused, you know, and... Uh, as far as off-duty, I really don't hang out with off-duty officers. There's a, there's a couple of them I do that are on the motorcycle unit that live nearby. So call, hey, let's go grab a bite to eat. You know, and my roommate out in uh, Washington, D.C. this past week was my regular partner who I ride with every day. So 
I guess we hung out a little bit, you know, but there's, you know, one of the things we typically don't do is talk shop, you know, when we're off duty, because there's so many other things to talk about, you know, and so we just kind of, you know, so in a specific place, it's not that I could come up with as far as off duty. Was there ever any moment where you were frightened or nervous for any sort of uh, yeah, there was, there was a couple uh, during the riots, or as politically correct term would be the civil unrest. You know, we were out there in our cars and getting rocks and you name it was getting thrown at us. That was a little nerve wracking. Um, I almost, you know, I almost got you know, a, car, a stolen car t bone me, backed up and went to t bone me again. And that was scary. Shoved my squad car across an alley that I was sitting in. So that was a little scary. The person said, "Yeah, I know. I know it was an officer. I was trying to get. I was trying to get out of there." So they got seven years for their actions. Um, another scary moment, I guess. They're they're really they're really besides those things. You know, you know like you know, like the they call it the pucker factor. Like you know, like the holy the holy s moment. You know, really. You know, you get some of those. You get some of those on a traffic stop. You know, when a car will come flying by you, and you your body will shake because they come flying by you so close. Whether it's intentional or not, I have no idea. But otherwise, the the fear part of it, it there isn't much. But sometimes fear makes you smart. You know? Um. So you said you had a partner. Did you get to choose your partner, or like, was he assigned to you, and then you just stick together the entire time? Um, currently, or throughout my career? Throughout your career. Throughout the career, when I was new, it was, here's who you're working with. You know, I called it war, I was war horsing, so I never had an established one, so it's like, wherever somebody needed a partner, they just throw me in there. Then when I was on the beat, I had a regular partner, uh, Truman, and then a regular partner, so Truman went on, then uh, James, uh, he's now a sergeant with uh, the U.S. Marshals. Very proud of him. I, I, I feel like a big brother to him because I brought, I picked him to be my next partner and he was brand new. Uh, so when I get to the motorcycles, I chose being brand new. I asked one of the senior guys, hey, can I be your partner on this? And he's very smart, very knowledgeable. He said, yeah, absolutely. Um, the partner I have now, I kind of brought him when he went to day shift. He went from uh, early shift, which is 3 to 11. Or I'm sorry, he was on early power, which was 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. I went to day shift. I said, I want I want him with me. You know, so I kind of was able to be like a coach for my district. So I got I got Ryan and I got Julian. I got myself. So the three, there's supposed to be four, but the three of us, we clean up pretty good. It's... Uh, the bosses in District Seven know that when they hear our, our numbers, our squad numbers, their their officers aren't going to have to worry about investigating an accident because they they just don't have time to do the follow up that we do because that's what we're supposed to do on our unit. Um, do you have to go for like long rides on some travel motorcycles for that kind of Every so often we'll we'll get special events. Uh, there's this being the riding season, we've got, as a matter of fact, tomorrow, I was just on the phone with my boss, my sergeant, told me to bring a shirt and tie because I might be riding out to Madison tomorrow for a law enforcement, um, like a memorial for a law enforcement memorial. So that's out to Madison. That's, I've done that a number of times. Uh, there's escorted rides that will do from, for example, the House of Harley on the south side where we got one coming up. Uh, June, I think it's June 3rd, it's, it's the cops ride. So there's gonna be about 800 motorcycles and we have to escort them safely on their route, wherever their route might take them. So it takes a lot of planning and a lot of, and a lot of paying attention to what you're doing because you don't wanna be the one that causes a screw up, you know, because <laughs> you, know, you get your finger pointed, you get that finger pointed at you all the time. And so yeah, that's, that's a pretty long ride. You know, and when I say long, that cops ride is might be about three hours, but because you got so many motorcycles going throughout the city. 
Um, did you have to escort, like, what was, like, your favorite escort? Like, who was it? Um, I'd have to say Mike Pence. Back in the days when they were campaigning, when Trump and Pence were campaigning, and I'll say it was my favorite, and a lot of people were scared about it because we went from from a signature airfield, which is right by basically Mitchell, out to Waukesha Airport, right across from uh, Center Court. You guys know where Center Court is. So we're going on the freeway, and once we crossed into Waukesha County, we were flying. And the, guy, the poor guy next to me, he was scared white as it goes because we're going 100 miles an hour. And it was very unorganized, but I, I'm yelling at him. I said, hey, if you're nervous, we're yelling at him, just drop out. Just tap your helmet and drop out and get to the back of the line. So you don't, you know, so he ended up doing, taking my advice. So, so that was, that was a, that was a fun one. Um, any Portis, any Portis visit, you know, if you're, we call it a six pack, you know, we're right in front of basically the whole, the, the whole uh, escort. In the six pack, so that's that's pretty neat. When you have other jurisdictions now that get involved and they know the same language that we're talking, so. Um, starting as a police officer, is there anything that you worry about or like every day you worry about that could happen? Uh, in the beginning, it was, am I ever going to get this right? <laughs> you know, because well, when you're out on your own. That's why you got friends. Hey, am I doing this right? You call them up, you know, and yeah, yeah. You know, I guess that that worry probably would go about maybe three years for me. I'd ask other people, were you always un unsure if you made the right decision on this? Like, yeah, it lasted five years. And then you start, you know, once you start getting into the role of things and knowing how to do things, now it's second nature. You know, that's, it, don't get me wrong, there's always going to be something. You know, like right now, like an OWI situation, there could be one that pops up. Wow, this is a weird one. You, you know, like uh, there was one on last Saturday or Sunday where five people got killed in a crash, and one person went through the red light speeding. That had the people that got killed, and the other person that had the green light was drunk driving. But it wasn't that person's fault. So I would, I mean, they arrested both drivers, but that would be one of those. Well, now what do I do? You know, I got this big mess here. I mean, I, I know that both people would go, but that's the harder parts on the district attorney on how are they going to determine what to do on this? What was the hardest part for you? Um, waiting. Waiting to get on the job. You know, because it was two years, you know, where, you know, you're, you're on this, I'm working a job where I'm, thinking, okay, I'm not going to be here very long because I'm going to get picked up by the police department. Well, with budgetary reasons, what have you, it just kind of puts you on the waiting list, you know. So that was probably, I, I think that was probably one of the harder parts is just having patience and waiting to get on the job. Looking at it now, uh, would you still want to become a cop or would you want to have changed your life path and career path? Knowing what I know now and the things that are going on right now, uh, maybe move to it early. I'd ha I would have to make the move early to a different agency, a different city. You know, the, the behavior has changed since I started. Um, when I first started, it was, when I first started, it was a shooting once every so often. Now you get three shootings a day, it seems like. So the behavior obviously has changed. What person is sitting in the university of They're all over. I, you know, I, I mean, yeah, there, there's a certain core area where a lot of it happens, you know, but, you know, be, you'd be foolish to think, oh, this ain't going to happen here. And all of a sudden, you know, you're the one that's in charge of the scene. And, you know, so it's good to pay attention, like in service where it's like, like a continuing education. It's good to pay attention in in-service and not play on your phone or sleep. Is there a certain thing that happens in this every day? Right now, probably the reckless driving and the, and the speeding, you know, the, the bad driving habits, uh, the stolen cars. I think that's the biggest hot topic right now besides, besides the homicide rate, you know, but I think this 
this is the biggest thing going on right now. So they look at us and another the traffic safety unit to try to curb that. You know, it's and it's difficult. You're fighting an uphill battle. So do you pull over cars? Yes. So how many? How many people that you pull over that you know? Like, or yeah. Uh, it doesn't happen too often, but when it does, it's kind of awkward, you know, because there's certain things that I have to do with being on body camera, you know, that that uh, there's a Collins agreement and ACLU, they expect certain things, you know, and when you got your body camera on, back in the day, if I pull over, if I would have pulled over you and I know you, I walk up to your car and say, oh, Maddox, behave, you, you know, because... There's kind of a conflict of interest, you know. You can't, you, you know, and uh, but usually, usually I, I don't cut brakes on tickets too often. You know, it, it's got to be a really good, valid reason, which you think you probably heard them all. I haven't heard any original ones in a long time. Were there ever any like, odd cases? Um, there was an OWI case where I was on the stand for almost an hour. Uh, and it was all hung up on a timing issue. Um, there's this thing called the 20-minute observation that we have to uh, observe the person, make sure they don't regurgitate, uh, belch, you know, or vomit, uh, smoke cigarettes or chew gum for doing a breathalyzer test. Well, it was one minute was the difference from when I did the test from when I started the observation. And... The judge sided with me. He said, no, he did everything because this particular person was arrested like an hour prior, an hour prior. So, and I asked the question, hey, did you, did you vomit, regurgitate, anything like that, drink anything? No. So he was in custody for an hour, didn't have anything. So that one minute, the judge said, no, this is good. So that was kind of funny because at that point when I was in the stand, the defendant looks at his... <laughs> He looks at his uh, attorney, and the attorney says, uh, we'd like to have a sidebar and arrange a plea deal. <laughs> so right there, the, the guy knew he was sunk, and that was somebody I knew. That made it weird. And not know like friend, but acquaintance. Acquaintance, so it was kind of awkward. Has there been any like case or something that you did that could have your job? Um... Well, no, I don't think so. You know, there, there's never a, never a time where I was nervous about losing my job. You know, to this day, I haven't been nervous about it. There may have been, yeah. if you, I guess you're more nervous going on the stand. You know, because with, now with the body camera stuff, you know, you got to make sure that what you say on the stand correlates with what your body camera shows, you know, because... Someone could call you a liar, even if it might be an honest mistake, it doesn't look good. But if you write a good enough report and you're solid with your report, chances are you don't get questioned on it too much. If you had the option, would you um, switch to being an officer in another state? Uh, well, yeah, at this point, no. Like I said earlier, I would have made the move early on. You know, and, and that's what some people are doing right now. They go to the academy, get certified, and then boom, see you later. You know, they, they take advantage of it. But my, my thought process and my interview for the department, I said, if whoever shows me uh, loyalty first, I will be loyal, to, loyal back. You know, so it's 25 years of, of work, and I'm, at, I'm in my 19th now. So time is going to start going quick, which start thinking about the future, like, man, what am I going to do now? When that time comes, am I going to pull the plug right away? You know, and people ask me that question, and I just respond with it depends on the climate. You know, is it is it an anti-police climate? Is it a defund the police climate? You know, if so, that might hasten my decision to retire right when I get to 25. But if things smooth out, maybe I'll stick around for an extra year or two. Um... Do the different units of the Milwaukee Police Force, do they, like, is there, like, any feud between them, or is it, like, one big family? Like, I, I would say it's pretty much one big family. 
you know, there's a, a lot of joking. You know, like we, we do roll call with the tactical unit, the boat unit, the canine unit, uh, the horse unit. So you got four or five different u- units in the same room. There's a lot of poking and stabbing, all in good humor. But when it comes down to taking care of business, when we're out there on the street, everybody backs everybody. You know, there isn't any personal issues that, like, oh, I ain't going over there because of this person. You know, I don't like this, but no, you go there and you help out your fellow officer, no matter what. No matter what. Are you excited to Uh, the days I don't want to go because I, I keep my motorcycle. I live in the city still, so I'm able to take the motorcycle home. And the days that I don't want to go to work would have been probably every day in the month of April because it was raining just about every day. And it was, oh, 35 degrees or 40 degrees riding to work on a motorcycle in, in rain and cold. Those are the days where I don't want to go to work. But once you're there, you just take care of business, you know, so... So during the months of winter, can you, like, you ride a car? Or you yep. Like, yeah. Yep, you get a car. Yeah, they, back in the day, though, they used to have sidecars. You know, motorcycles used to have sidecars, and you'd ride year-round. Insurance agent, sales insurance, health insurance. What does she think about you doing? She's probably the best, one of the best people that I could have for a wife because her dad did the job. She grew up, obviously, watching her dad go to work every day in a uniform and coming home oddball hours. So she was already accustomed to it. Um, so she understands. Divorce rate on the police department is outrageous because... The spouse of the person that's not on the job, they don't understand. You, you know, where, where my wife understood when I was working 3 to 11, if I had overtime, there were nights where I wouldn't get home till 6 in the morning. And I always would tell her, if the phone doesn't ring, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, that means I'm fine. If you get a phone call, then be worried about it. So a couple of times I had to call her where I was involved in an accident. You know, so I had to take the hospital and let her know what's going on before the media would say something. Say, what? I recognize that car or I recognize that motorcycle. Um, kind of going back to your childhood, um, what did you know like, about the Washington or what was it kind of like? Um, well, what I knew about it, being at that age, was kind of very little. You know, I... I I knew there were bad things that happened. I knew what neighborhoods not to go back in, in those days, you know, which were very far off east from where I was living. Uh, even when I was on 64th Street, there was areas, you know, when I was old enough to go back there. Well, it ain't so bad. You know, and now being an officer, when I go by there, it ain't the worst. You know, there's plenty of worse areas out there yet in, in the city, you know, with, with just... You know, low income poverty type of thing. Was there like any meeting spots that everyone would know and hang out at as a child? Um, Northwest Little League Field, which was on 103rd and Silver Spring. I got, I took some pictures of it that I'll pass along. Now it was when I was playing Little League baseball, it was two diamonds, two, two 200 foot diamonds, and one 300 foot diamond. 300 foot one was for, uh, 13 year olds and up and the other ones were you know from minor leagues to majors which was up to 12 then it expanded and it became i can't like the hound dogs or something like that but now it's completely bare uh the fences are down because scoreboards are still up but it's it's gone basically so it's kind of weird seeing it like that um so being a kid to now, what do you think has changed the most? Just in um, where you live or... Uh, behavior. You know, and, and I I think that's more of a country-wide thing. Um, you know, a lot of lack of respect. 
towards law enforcement, towards my job. Um, and the ones that do lack, have the lack of respect, it's way up here. But I think there's more more good people than than bad people out there. I could be sitting in like in some really bad neighborhoods, like 27th and Burley, doing a traffic doing traffic enforcement, and people will come up and say, "Hey, thanks for being here." You know, and it doesn't matter what color the person is that says it to me. You know, but you're in a neighborhood you know, 53206, which is deemed a really terrible zip code. Well, they'll still come up and hey, thanks for doing what you're doing. And, so it makes you feel good, you know, and very rarely do I get the old F the police comment, you know, very rarely. So I don't know if it's the way I present myself or no idea, but there's a lot of people that get it a lot more than I do, the neg negative comments. So I guess I consider myself lucky. Did you ever, like, especially during, like, the, the BLM protests and stuff like that, did you ever think you wanted to just quit your job? No. No, I never thought that. You know, I thought, what is one of the comments I said? I don't think I have much tongue left in my mouth anymore because I keep biting it every day, <laughs> you know, so I don't say the wrong thing. You know, I, as a matter of fact, right out, right out your school here, um, at about 34th or 33rd during all that stuff, I had this kid, he had to be about 17, right in my face, this close. Give me the Raz, Raz Act, and I just stood there, took it, you know, and thinking if this badge would fall off my chest, <laughs> it would give me a different story. No, you know, but uh, you just got to be patient. That's that's what we're taught. You know, this is what you, one of the negative things you have to expect that that'll happen on the job. It's not all, you know, sunshine and lollipops. Um, be open-minded, use discretion, you know, not everybody is bad. Um, remember who you are, stick to your morals, stick to what, what your values are. And I pretty much took that along with me from, because our, our slogan in our, our academy class was remember who you are, you know, because it's really easy, it's really easy to get cynical and take that paintbrush and well this person's bad so that whole entire group of people is going to be bad you know just like it reverses on us where like something negative happens on the police department all of a sudden all cops are bad cops you know which isn't the truth you know there's there's bad apples in everything you know you're never going to get 100 percent uh perfect yeah so going along with that so, especially during the BLM, like, civil rights protests and stuff like that, was there ever, like, was there ever a case where you, you thought you were going to, like, die or, like, one of your friends, like, fellow police officers were going to just, like... Um, they did a pretty good job. The department did a pretty good job of protecting the officers, but... There were times where when it was hitting the fan, yeah, there's a little bit of nerve, little bit of nerves because they just were going absolute. People were just going absolutely crazy, you know. It's like a free for all, and you know, we, you know, you can't engage on something because then you're using up all your resources on one thing where you want to make you got to look at the bigger picture, you know. So dur during that whole time. You know, there, there, there's some a little bit of nerve-wracking things where they started telling us to uh, start arresting people. You know, arrest people for driving reckless or something. You know, it's, well, they have to stop first. You know, I'm not going to get into a pursuit because that's going to cause more problem than what's already at hand. So decision-making is when you're the one behind the wheel driving that car or that motorcycle, you know, you got to make, you're the one that makes the decisions. And you have to live with those choices. So when there's a, like a traffic stop or like something bad that happens, do you just go on, go on about like what happened and you make all the choices? Or do you have to like, um, talk to other officers? And... Well, maybe to clarify that, meaning something goes bad, what would you mean by going bad? 
probably the first like, case where there's like a shooting. Okay. Like, do you radio the other officers, or do you just like straight go and do what you can? Well, you, we'll notify the dispatcher. You all say, "Hey, squad, you know, squad, blah blah blah. Show me headed to, show me headed there." You, you know, so if there's something, something major that happens, and yeah, you go. Like I said, all hands on deck. Um, otherwise, like on a traffic stop, usually my approach to a traffic stop, I put people at ease. I don't want people thinking that, oh, this guy's gonna rip me out of the car type of attitude. You know, I. I say hi very polite and i don't pile tickets on people you know two at the most you know for the infraction and if they don't have a license you know i'll, I'll get them two because some people will pile on and give someone six tickets at a traffic stop well and then those people have they're so in the hole they feel like well how am i gonna get out of this hole i'm not even gonna bother trying to fight this you know so then now they gotta suspend their license and they got warrants out for their arrest because, you know, so if you give people an opportunity to try to get out of the little traffic mess that they cause for themselves, it goes a long way. Um, what do you do to stay motivated in the Uh, you know, like, like what Maddox was saying, like doing the BLM stuff, you know, they're, they're, they're civil unrest. There's a lot of long days and you know, staying motivated, staying motivated is tough during those long hours because it was summertime, it's hot out, you know, and you're sitting in a car, you know, no air conditioning in some of these cars, and, and you know, you're just sweating like crazy and trying to keep your head on a swivel. So keeping motivated would be, you know, thinking about the next day, you know, just, okay, tomorrow will come, things will calm down type of thing. Um, no matter how bad things would get, you always have to think, it's going to get better eventually. And obviously, it has. Uh, what do you think your greatest failure on the job was? Greatest failure on the job? Hmm. That's a good question because I can't think of any. You know, but I have to go through the Rolodex on the failure side, which is really limited. You know? <laughs> um. You know, I, you know, I, I can't, can't come up with one. Well, what have you learned from your past mistakes? Uh, go with your instincts. Go with your instincts. Don't, you know, if you think, if you think something is, should be one way, don't let someone else try to talk you out of it. Even if that means a bigger mess for you, yourself to handle as far as like, Oh, I'm going to be here for a while writing a report on this, but, you know, do the right thing. Do you ever have to work with uh, Not anymore. Not anymore. Um, I think I'm five or six years on day shift now, so I work 7 a.m. to 3. It's my regular. And then anything after that for overtime, uh, typically the latest will be like midnight. Unless something, unless, once again, unless something happens, you know, that's out of control, that they need all hands on deck. While you're um, on your shift, is there always something that you have to attend or, or do you ever have for time for yourself? Uh, yeah, I get time for myself, you, you know, and usually that time for myself is time to catch up on things. You know, if I'm behind on a report or if I have to call somebody on a follow-up call regarding an investigation of, of a crash or something. You know, there, there's always something to do, but it's, you know, some days are way busier than others. You know, without a doubt, I think uh, I've been gone now for about two weeks now with the D.C. trip. But I was, my partner and I, uh, he has like a hundred, it's got to be about a, over 120 accidents that he filed. I'm, I'm at about 110. That's just for this year. And that's for two people. So you can just imagine throughout the city. How many accident reports have been filed? You know, quite a bit. Because that's just, like I said, that's about 200, 200 some crashes between two people for an eight hour shift. You know, you gotta remember 24 hours in a day, so. So, wanting to be a police officer, like what did you hope to achieve? Where I'm right now, on the motorcycle unit. That was my number one goal, and 
you know, I, I, from day one when I when I got accepted, I just fell in love with it and thought, I make just as much money as a sergeant, so why do I want to be a sergeant? <laughs> do, you, do you plan on expanding your goals? Um, at this point, I don't think so. You know, I, I I'm where I want to be. You know, basically, so you know, not many people can say. I look forward to going to work, and I like my and I love my job. You know, even even on the worst days, my worst day at work is better than some people's best day. Um, what do you remember about the Brewers when you were a child? The Brewers, 1982, of course. You guys, 12 years old. Uh, looking at that picture up there with Ted Simmons, Cecil Cooper, Gorman Thomas, Robin Yount, and Ben Ogilvy. I knew everything about that team. Uh, major baseball card collector back in those days. So I got the, all their numbers, you know, even the ones that aren't on that picture, like Mark Brohar, number 29. Charlie Moore, number 22, backup catcher to Ted Simmons. Pete Vukovic, number 50, pitcher. Raleigh Fingers, 34. Moose Haas, 30, I believe his number was. Um, Mike Caldwell, 48, I believe. Uh, Slayton, Jim Slayton, 42. I believe it was Don Money, number seven, Larry Heisel, number six, Roy Howell, number 13. I think that almost covers it all. <laughs> uh, Sixto Lascano, number 16. I don't think he was on that 82 team, though. But, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of fond memories, fond memories. I thought they had the coolest uniforms back then, that powder blue and the gold and dark blue. Always imitating them, their batting stances when I was in Little League Baseball. So one year it was my Robin Young stands. You know, I tried the Gorman Town stands, but I wasn't too productive with that one. So I went back to the Robin Young stands. <laughs> played played pretty much every position in baseball when I was growing up, except for maybe one or two times at first base. Otherwise, I, I was everywhere. My, my main one was th uh, third base catcher and a little bit in the outfield. But then I started to develop a, a love for being in the outfield because I... I could run. I was fast, and I loved tracking down, tracking down a hard fly ball. So, who's your favorite Brewers player? I'm all the ones who just listed. Oh boy, you know they all have their their certain stays. You know, Pete Vukovic for that big curly hair, that Fu Manchu. Raleigh Fingers had that really killer handlebar mustache. You know, Robin Yelk just because of his of his uh, flair. I forgot Paul Molitor, number four. And I forgot Jim Gantner, number 17. I forgot the two big big guys from that team. Um, Cecil Cooper, because his batting stance was so unique. You know, Ted Simmons, because I was a catcher. I learned a lot of stuff just watching him when I was catching. You know, some of the mannerisms and the movement that he would do behind the plate. You know, and, you, you know, he's just... So it was very hard. If I, uh, Gorman Thomas, probably just because he's a big slugger, you know, because he was... He's, the big home run hitter on the team back then. How big of an impact do you think the Brewers had in uh, Back then, I, I think it was a very positive impact. You know, uh, earlier when I mentioned Bat Night and some of the other promotional nights that they had, you know, I remember my mom would, would take me and my brother, you know, to as many as she could, you know, had a good time. You know, then obviously they went to the dark years before where they're at now, where they're showing signs of life in that past, you know, since council took over. But I actually think probably since, probably since the stadium, you know, since when it was Miller Park, that that was a good shot to the arm of, of good uh, positivity. Were the Bucks or the Brewers more popular? I was a all-around sports fan so I think uh, I'd have to say even like I, even though I said earlier I didn't go to many Bucks games at all uh, way more Brewer games than Bucks games Bucks games I probably went they count them on one hand you know but uh, I followed the Bucks you know number four Sidney Moncrief and Brian Winters 32 you know 16 Bob Lanier Bob Lanier the biggest shoe back in the day you know some, you know Sidney Moncrief Junior Bridgman you know, all these, you know, uh, Ricky Pierce, you know, so I, I knew all these, I knew the names, knew the players. I watched a lot, you know, the, keep in mind back then, cable TV and satellite and all this stuff. 
you could just turn on the TV and watch your favorite team. You know, you had to wait till Saturday on CBS, which was Channel 6. You had to wait. Hopefully, the Bucks was like the featured game of the day or something, you know. And usually when they played the Celtics or Sixers, you know, and hated the Sixers. Boy, I hated the Celtics. As a Lakers fan, if the Bucks were ousted, I was a Lakers fan. Um, so back to uh, the Brewers. Do you think Do you think Miller Park was a good replacement for Town Stadium? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent, state of the art. You know, it's still considered one of the better venues in baseball right now. Do you remember when Alfred was built? That was the same time with uh, with uh, now Amfam Field. So yeah, I was. That was a pretty neat park. I still think it's neat when I go there, when I work a Brewer game. When I work there, I'll go by there all the time and just think, man, I wish I could have played on that when I was a kid. I still would like to go down there and play on it. Um, do you have any, like, distinct memories of going to any Brewers games? Um, that night, like I said earlier, I guess it was Mountain Dew Bat Night, now that I remember. They gave you a, a 32-inch wooden bat and it was green. It had the Brewer logo on it in red and the Mountain Dew logo. And I savored that bat. Now, nah, who knows where it is. It got all beat up and weathered and everything. But... Who was your biggest role model? Hmm. I'd have to, I'd have to say my friend, my best friend, TJ, his dad, he was my baseball coach. His family took me in like one of their own, you know, so they treated me to a lot of stuff, like whether it was ice cream after a ball game or a hamburger after a ball game, uh, pizza at Mama Mia's, you know, after a ball game. You know, they're, they're always there, always positive. Um, my mom was a good role model also. You know, I don't want to exclude her. She pretty much taught at work ethic. You know, because she worked being a single mom, so she worked. And sometimes she worked two jobs, but for the most part, she worked one job. But she, I don't even, I'm sure she called it sick, but I don't ever remember her calling it sick to, to work. Where did she work? She worked at uh, J.C. Penney's. That was on Burleigh in Highway 4145. It's now at Amazon uh, Warehouse, which... They haven't even opened it yet, but yeah, she worked there for 40 years, I believe. And then she worked for Kohl's a department store. She retired from there after maybe 10 years. So, you know, she she would find a job and she would stick with it, it you know. And I never heard her complain. You know, the, the only complaining that she ever did about work was when she's at J.C. Penney's. This was at the corporate office. Uh, she used to have to do a 7 at night to 7 in the morning. That one, that one took a toll on her. You know, she, she didn't like doing that one. But otherwise, never heard her complain. So, earlier we talked about how you moved um, from house to house. Which uh, house was your favorite to build? Oh. Each place has its individual memory. The apartment on 64th, eh, not so much. You, you know, not so much because I was too young. To, to notice, I did get in a fight there once. I had a fight all set up. You know, I was like five or six years old. It's gonna be a funny one. So we're rolling on the ground after supper. You know, we're out there fighting on the ground, and we're rolling and tussling. The kid reaches over. I, I don't even know who this kid was. So he picked up a pork chop bone, and he crowned me right in the middle of the forehead. I still got the scar to this day. And you're 52 years old. Got the scar. I went running into the apartment. You know, and. Like I said, I, I got I got pictures, blood pouring down like a wrestler, and the the uh, landlord and my parents lived across from each other, and I'm screaming my head off. I go running up the stairs, and Roy Schrader was his name, the nickname Stoneface. <laughs> he opens up the door, Mike, what happened to you? Blood, I got hit in the head. He goes, Oh, you'll be okay. He puts his little butterfly bandage on, and blood still pouring. <laughs> my before my parents realized it, but that was that was funny. Uh, the second place, the great memories was uh, the uh, they had this thing called the Monkey Hills. There was a bunch of dirt that was piled up from the landscapers. 
So we made them in, into ramps, you know, like like a dirt bike track. And I went I went over the handlebars, cracked my chin. I got the scar there. Had a hole in my chin like that, just pouring, pouring out. My bike broke, and oh, my mom, what happened to you? Getting my first stitches of my life, and they had to strap me down because it hurt so bad. I was so that was a good memory. Uh, maybe not the favorite place, but probably the place uh, before we moved out of the city because there's a huge yard. You know, I, I could just throw up a ball and play baseball with myself, at, you know, and just practice hitting by myself. And it was a wide open field before they, before it developed. So that in the place across the street, down the road, there's a condo complex, which is still there. They had a pool there. So this, the only real good friend I had there that was a couple of years older than me, we always went swimming. I was looking for, he had a diving board and everything. I thought it was cool jumping off a diving board back then. Now all that stuff is a liability, so they don't have them anymore. <laughs> um, okay, so what is one of your favorite memories growing up? Um, setting out to do something and achieving it. You know, it, you know like uh, making my very first baseball team, I, I bet just eight years old. I wanted to play it so bad. And they're playing across the street from another house that I forgot to mention that I semi-grew up in. It was 50-50, yeah, 50-50 North 106th Street. So when I was growing up, this was our nanny. So right across the street was Parkview School. They had a baseball down there. I want to play that game. I want to play that game. So I went down, hey, how do I sign up? And the, the coach, thing, Rick Kreitlow, he goes, well, here, can you throw he gave me a tennis ball, and on the side of the school was a box for, you ever hear the game strikeout? So he goes, let me see what you can do. So, boom, I was throwing that ball, hitting that square every time. So he throws, throws me a shirt. He goes, hey, practice is, oh, I can't remember that, but he threw me a shirt. and says, yeah, but the shirt I had was an adult extra large. I was one of the smaller kids back in my days of growing up. So the shirt was, when I was, like, I don't know, maybe it was like 25 years old, it finally fit me like the way it should have. But uh, it was that was, uh, so I made that team, and then, you know, every year he had to try out just like what you guys have to do with, for volleyball type of thing, and, you know, you, you make that goal, and it was great, you know, so it, great memories, um, setting a goal and achieving it and staying focused. Okay, and then, um, I guess our last question we have for you is, is there anything that you'd like to add that, you know, tonight you're going to ask you? Ah, boy. We covered quite a bit, you know, I guess uh, if there's anything that I could would change, you know, a lot of people, when I look in the rearview mirror, I think I would have done, I don't think I would have done many things much differently. Um, seeing how the city has changed as far as the landscape, not, not behavior, Pat, but just the landscape, you know, when I went and took pictures of where I first grew up, what it looks like now, not much different. The, the building itself got a facelift. The second place looks the same, you know, not much different. The third place is now a strip mall. That's why we moved, because they sold the land, built the strip mall there. Um, the Little League field, nothing there. There's just dirt and some weeds, and like I said, the four or five scoreboards that are left standing. Um, I guess, uh, I guess, for, for uh, advice, if you're looking for advice from an older person, don't lose faith. You know, stick, like I said earlier, stick to who you are. And even on your worst day, keep in mind it's going to get better. <laughs>